The information in this lecture is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professionals. You should not rely upon or follow the program or techniques or use any of the products and services made available by or through the lecture without obtaining the advice of a physician or other healthcare professional. The nutritional and other information in this lecture are not intended to be and do not constitute health care or medical advice. This is uh, Dr. Ray Cooley, and he's a chiropractor, and I'm going to let him tell you more about where his practice is and the focus of his practice and what his topic is going to be today. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, um, did everyone get one of those sheets like uh Well, yeah, so I'm Dr. Cooley. Um, I'm actually from Buffalo originally. I went to University of Buffalo for undergrad. My background, my, my undergrad was actually in um, chemical engineering, which is kind of, I think, why I gravitate towards this biochemistry side of um, chiropractic. But when I, uh, when I first graduated from school, uh, I basically did what most other chiropractors do. I um, did a lot of like manual therapy, like muscle type work on patients, and then I would do like uh, typical like spinal adjusting. And it would bother me that you could have two people come in with like the same low back complaint, and you do the same treatment on both of them, and one person would get better and the other person wouldn't. And trying to figure out why that other person wouldn't get better kind of led me down this path of, well, one, trying to figure out better ways to evaluate patients. And I'll show you kind of how I evaluate people at the end. But what it ended up really leading me towards was what, what really drives these people that are in a state of chronic pain is they're in, a really, they're in a state of chronic inflammation. And until you can figure out why the person is inflamed, they're always gonna have issues. And, and what's happened because of that, because my, I got into inflammation as a way to try to go after injuries. But if you start addressing inflammation, you can realize that you can address a lot of other issues. And um, we're going to kind of talk about that. So what do all these chronic diseases have in common? So we're looking at, there's a lot of stuff on that list. And honestly, any disease you can think of, there's going to be an inflammatory component to it. Whether or not it's the primary issue why someone has that problem. But... Almost anything that somebody is dealing with on a long-term basis, um, let's just take a thyroid issue because it's so common in this area. Um, you might go to the doctor and they run your labs. They might, you might see that your TSH is elevated and then they're gonna be like, oh, all right, you got a hypothyroid, your thyroid's underactive. But, and, and they might give you like a thyroid prescription to bring that number back into check, but they really, and then that's nothing wrong with that approach, but they haven't really explored that next level as to why that thyroid number was off. And most people, their thyroid number is going to be off due to some form of Hashimoto's. And the reason Hashimoto's is there is because that's an autoimmune condition. So if you keep backing it up, you really, in order to address why you have thyroid issue, you really need to back up to the immune system and why you have this autoimmune response. And that's just one example. It's kind of a, it's very similar for almost anything on this list. like. Mitochondrial dysfunction or chronic fatigue, that's like a kind of a hot topic. I don't know if anyone's gotten that diagnosis, but it's, it's, it's becoming a more common diagnosis when someone goes to see their doctor. And from my perspective, one of the big reasons why someone has chronic fatigue is their body is already inflamed, like too inflamed, and it intuitively knows that I can't keep making energy because energy Making energy can be an inflammatory process, so the body basically shuts down those energy-producing enzymes. And that's a big reason why people have chronic fatigue. But we'll uh, keep going. If you have questions, truthfully, I actually just like you asking them during the presentation. If we get too caught up, then I might move them to the end. But if you have, if you have a question about something, just stop me, because I'd rather just talk off the cuff, honestly. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask about chronic fatigue. Define that more Well, I mean, it, it, it depends on the person, honestly. Like, like chronic fatigue patients, I like. Well, so fatigue is the number one complaint, most common complaint in any doctor's office. It might not be the reason why someone went to the doctor, 
But if you were to like look at my symptom survey or look at anybody else's symptom survey, fatigue is like the most often checked one. Um, that being said, like there's definitely, it's kind of like pain. Like pain is really kind of in the eye of the beholder. Chronic fatigue is kind of in that same envelope. Like it's, it's very similar. Like, like what one person thinks is being tired all the time versus some people are like, they can't get out of bed. They'll go and they'll take a nap for like eight hours. Like there's like different levels to it. So it's kind of hard to say. There's really no one definitive diagnosis for it, honestly. It's kind of. The definition same. of what chronic fatigue is, I guess it's in the eye of whoever. Yeah, I mean, that, like unfortunately, <laughs> like that, that symptom or that, I don't really want to call it a disease, but it's basically, you're basically, you're labeling something. It doesn't. There's no like real concrete like definition of it. Yeah. And honestly, that's kind of the way for most of those diagnoses, yeah. you know. Um, so, um, oh, yeah. Concerning chronic fatigue, if after most meals that you eat, you become extremely tired. Yeah. To where sometimes non-functional or just maybe get the way to eat. Yeah, I mean, a, a big yeah. reason for that, it, it depends on what you're eating. So, there could be a couple reasons for that. One, if you're eating, it, like, the biggest reason why someone gets tired after they eat is because of the, their body can't handle the insulin spike that happened after they ate. But if you're eating a food that really shouldn't drive your insulin levels up, you're probably having some digestive issue that's like really, your body can't digest that food very easily. So they diverting all its attention that way. So it basically kind of shuts you down. Um, so it, that would be the biggest reason for that. But it, it the most common reason why like most people get tired after they eat, like, like at Turkey or, or Thanksgiving, like everyone thinks it's like the tryptophan in the turkey, which is kind of BS, but really it is you overate and your insulin levels are like through the roof and that causes these, <laughs> basically these mechanisms to shut down your, um, it increases these serotonin levels that tire you out basically. Um, yeah, right? <laughs> so uh, when we're talking about inflammation, um, inflammation and pain get kind of used synonymously, but they are different things. Like inflammation is really, I cut my finger, what heals that wound is inflammation. So it's this, it's this chemical process that occurs um, in a response to tissue injury. So like a good example would be like, all right, say like a tornado came and like hit this town. Um, the alarm going off and like, sounding the authorities, that's kind of like the pain alarm, right? That's like the signal like it's sent to tell the proper authorities, like, all right, you guys gotta go do something, or something's wrong, right? Um, but, like the cleanup crew coming in, like the tornado hits, there's all this damage, you still gotta, you gotta come in there and clean all that stuff up. That's kind of like what inflammation does, and it helps to like remodel things. What happens when people get stuck in this state of chronic inflammation, it's almost like the cleanup crew got called in, they did their job, but then the next day they came back again. And the next day they came back again. And you never actually reached this point of like rebuilding or you, you never shut down that, that cleanup crew basically. So you never actually heal. Um, so that being said, like without inflammation, we'd all be dead. And <laughs> like we would just, we'd cut and we'd bleed out or we'd get an infection and we'd never get over it. So it's not like we, we don't need it. We probably need it more than we don't need it actually. But the biggest thing with all those diseases is understanding that a lot of people are stuck in a state of chronic inflammation and that's what we need to try to avoid. And that's kind of basically what we're gonna be discussing today. Um, so like that being said, like, like taking ibuprofen all the time is not a good answer for inflammation. Or even like an athlete that works out too hard, they might think, oh, I gotta take that ibuprofen, otherwise I won't be able to get my workout in the next day. That's really not a good idea because you actually, in order to, like when you work out, you're basically trying to stress your system so that you can like build yourself back up, back, build yourself up stronger the next time. And what builds you back up is that inflammatory process. So by taking an ibuprofen and trying to shut that inflammation down, you're actually kind of like hindering your progress. You're almost better off like if you work out too hard, like listening to your body, be like, all right, I take a break, kind of in, basically enhance the inflammation or like just endure it, and then you should be better off in the long run. Um, the same, I guess the same thing could be said for like a chronic injury. I feel like sometimes patients get stuck 
in a chronic injury state because they're just pumping too many anti-inflammatories and it kind of never allows them to heal properly. Um, So the one thing I want to address with, with people too is like when you think of inflammation, you need to think of it as a systemic problem first that often will manifest itself as a local irritant. So like it's not uncommon if I'm treating a patient that has like a chronic hip issue or a chronic shoulder issue or plantar fasciitis that I have to be like, well, yeah, that's where the issue is or that's where you feel it. but. What's really driving that is your gut because your gut is driving your inflammation which is creating this issue in your foot or your hip. And like, so you gotta kind of think of that like, all right, if I have, um, so if I have an injury somewhere, I really need to think in terms of like, well maybe it's some systemic inflammatory issue why that injury isn't getting better. So maybe it's a digestive, maybe it's something going on that's creating that injury to like, that perpetuating cycle. Does that make sense? All right, and then, um, the other thing I think would help patients in general is if when we discussed inflammation, if we refer to it, what, what I really think of inflammation is, is, is chronic immune dysfunction. And if you thought of it in those terms, you'd actually have a better handle on what it really is. So like we just say inflammation, but we don't really understand what controls it. What really controls our body's inflammatory processes, like our inflammatory balance is our immune system. And then if you keep backing that up, 70% um, of our immune system is in our gut. So a lot of people that have these chronic inflammatory issues, you really want to look to the gut first as to like why there's something going on there. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So those are, those are basically like two key things. So, so what causes chronic inflammation? We're going to talk about each of these, well, most of them. Um, so first off, diet, and uh, Weston A. Price is definitely a good way to go to get your inflammation in check. Um, the second thing we'll spend some time on is called dysbiosis. Um, free radical pathology, allergies, well, we're gonna talk about all these on the reads list, so <laughs> we'll move on there. All right. <laughs> What's that? Oh, there you go, right? <laughs> so like, a lot of people refer to me as like the butter guy. Um, like in, I don't know if anyone knows like the Buffalo Wellness Center, it's like a, a another like not-for-profit group, but. Um, they always make fun of me because I'm always pushing butter on patients, but <laughs> <laughs> it is like one of the, so the, the Weston A. Price like principles, um, I think are a really good place to start for, uh, for a healthy diet actually. Um, I'm not just saying that because I'm here, like I, like I have uh, a milk share from Brian's farm and stuff. And um, but one of the biggest things that I see on patients is a lack of healthy fats in their diet, and specifically a lack of um, fat-soluble vitamins. Like vitamin A, which is a common uh, fat-soluble vitamin, I would say it's in my top five supplements that I have to use on a regular basis. Um, more so than even vitamin D, which everyone, part of that is because everyone's already taken vitamin D, but um, vitamin A and D have to be in balance, and since a lot of people are already taking vitamin A, or vitamin D, Vitamin A is like one of the most common supplements I have to put people on. The other biggest reason why people have vitamin A deficiencies is because vitamin A is like your protective layer, protective barrier for like anything that's outside of you. So that's like skin, eyes, lungs, gut. And because so many people have gut issues, they burn through their vitamin A and it carries over. So like that, that that's the biggest reason. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, no. no. I was just drawing, sorry. Yep. Oh, <laughs> I go kind of high on that. Um, I'll, it depends on the person. If I if it's a new patient, I'll, I I I might get up fifty thousand to seventy thousand IU's, which is kind of high. Um, but after like the initial phase, and I usually bring that down to like twenty five to fifty thousand. Um, so it, just to get back on topic, like a big thing with Weston A. Price, I would say like one of their and the leaders of the group could probably correct me on this, but um, I would say one of their biggest things that they push for patients is consumption of healthy fats. And what they consider healthy fats is a lot different than what your um, general practitioner is gonna consider. Mm -hmm. So for people that are new to the group or new, it, 
like I consider grass-fed butter one of the healthiest things you can actually eat. Um, there's like four main fats that you want to use. Uh, olive oil for salad dressings, you don't really want to cook with it unless the temperature is like below 325 degrees. Um, so oh, this is a big, big thing too with um, when it comes to olive oil, or I would just say salad dressings in general. So a lot of times someone might make like a healthy decision like, all right, I'm gonna have a salad for lunch, but then they go and they like ruin it because they take like the salad dressing from the store and it's just filled with vegetable oil and they just doused all their, and now they're eating all these omega-6 fats which drive up inflammation. So uh, one of the biggest things I can tell anybody is try to make your own salad dressing or just use olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that causes someone to need to take ibuprofen all the time um, is if their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is out of whack. So this means like you're, you have too much vegetable oil intake versus like not enough um, fish or fish oil intake, okay? And the other thing that combined with that that really screws that up is if your insulin levels are high. So like a recipe, a way, a way if somebody can set themselves up for like a pro-inflammatory diet is if they eat too much vegetable oil and too much um, refined carbohydrates, which will drive up insulin so that that combination together can really kind of screw up your body's fatty acid profile and make you inflamed. So it's not, it makes sense when you look at what everybody's buying and what everybody's eating, why there's so many chronic disease issues. Um, so if you could change your fat, the fats that you eat, so many things can get better. Um, like a, another way to think of what these healthy fats do in your body is, they, they kind of like act like an amplifier. So if I have a good fatty acid profile in my system, meaning like my cells are made up of nice healthy fats, and I get like a cut, or I get like some inflammation in my muscle here, like a nice healthy inflammatory response is, all right, we're gonna crank it up a little bit, heal that injury, and then we're gonna crank it back down. And that's, that's what happens when your fatty acid profile is nice and healthy. But the opposite will kind of happen if it's not. Like you'll get this like big ramp up of inflammation and then you'll never be able to like shut that down. And that's just one of the reasons. There's a lot of other reasons, but. Um, does anybody have any questions on that one? I mean, ideally it's gonna be from the source. I mean, that, that is one issue with fat in general, is like when you're eating animal fats, the toxicity of that animal, you're, at, you're kind of at risk. So that, so that is one problem. So that's why the source of the animal can be really important. And that, that's where Weston Ape Rides can be super beneficial because they have sources of all the, they have all the best like meat sources in the area and everything. Well, what was the animal was organic grass? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, we're all gonna get exposed to stuff. We just want to lessen that load as much as possible. So but that's why it's okay to eat lard, organic lard. Yeah. As opposed to regular oil. Well, yeah, it's, I, I would say it's definitely better than like cooking stuff in vegetable oil for sure. I mean, I mean the, lard for pigs. It has to be organic. Yeah, I mean, ideally, yes, you know, but do I? Eat, I don't eat organic everything. And I don't know. I shouldn't say that, but. It's just the way it is, you know? I mean, it's it's just yeah. hard to do, right? Oh, but yeah, I know. That would be, you would want to strive for that, essentially. Yeah, I'm just talking about the, the toxins in the pig fat, though. That it, it is a concern, fat. for sure. I mean, that, yeah. So whether it's organic or not, it's still there. It'll be different. <clears throat> An organic pig is not going to have nearly right. the same yeah. toxicity. But it's considered as, safe to eat if it's organic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about tox, toxins in general, like definitely want to lessen our load. But the biggest thing I think with toxins is actually improving your body to excrete them. I mean, like, yeah, if you're smoking all the time, that's a problem, right? Or if you're, I mean, some, say you're like working, you're like a, someone that works on the highway and you're breathing in all that emissions all the time, that's a problem. Like, you really need to be taking some like detox supplements probably regularly. Um, 
But as we get to the next, this next topic here, like dysbiosis, to me this is actually the number one reason why people have toxin, toxic issues, actually. Um, so has anyone heard of dysbiosis? <laughs> so it's a term that like, a lot, not a lot of people have heard of, it, which is kind of a shame because to me this is the number one reason why, help, like, for the most part, you guys wouldn't be here if you weren't concerned about your health, right? So I'm kind of preaching to the choir for this thing. But this is the number one reason why health conscious individuals can be stuck in a state of chronic inflammation. Like I have plenty of patients that their diet is like locked in, but they still have all these issues. This is the main reason. So what dysbiosis is, is we have an exposure and we're made up of all these different organs, like in our gut, for example, you have all these different bacteria, you actually have fungus and parasites, like you have all these things in there and they should be in a certain balance, right? But they can be thrown off balance and that can set off your immune system and create this chronic inflammatory issue in your gut. Um, unfortunately, like, well fortunately, like current research has shown like how much having um, like chronic monovirus or Epstein-Barr virus, how that could affect like someone with rheumatoid arthritis. There, there's actually like a ton of research on this stuff. Where I think we get into trouble is, it's really hard to take that information and use it in the typical general practitioner clinical setting. Um, it's nothing against them, it's just the way it is. Like it's hard to know um, what is driving this person's inflammation at what time. Like is it a virus, is it a bacteria, is it a fungus? is it most of the time it's actually kind of a combination of all these things. Like it's the total load on the system is what actually screws the person up. Um, so like to me, when I'm treating someone, like every, every practitioner has their own biases, right? When they're treating someone, like you see, you'll see someone that does emotional stuff. They're gonna think every problem you have is an emotional problem. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I'm structurally and inflammation based and from an inflammation standpoint, I'm biased towards this. Like this is like the biggest thing I'm looking at when I'm trying to treat somebody. Um, Cause I, to me, this sets up everything else. Leaky gut stuff, which are probably a lot of you guys have heard of, mm -hmm. which, relate, which drives allergies. Um, if you have this going on in your gut, it's almost like you have your own chemical plant going on in your body too. So like when you're talking about toxins, this is probably the number one toxin producer. Um, so all these things really come, really get driven from this. And a lot of the stuff on the periphery, like when people talk about adrenal function or, um, or even like a lot of brain issues, I still think are secondary to this. It doesn't always happen that way, but this is the biggest thing I'm always looking at in patients. So, oh, uh, yep, go ahead. It is common, actually. <laughs> like, it's kind of hard to explain how I test, the way I test for them is gonna be different than if you had like some stool test done for it. Um, I'm kind of looking at more of a neurological response to it. And people respond to them very frequently which I'm not really doing a good job describing it. Uh, I guess I could just say it's pretty, it's more common than you think. Like, um, not necessarily, it depends. It depends on how locked in your diet is and if you get on the right stuff at the right time, basically. It can be difficult, but not always. Um, so the best ways to correct the dysbiosis are, um, like a lot of times if, if someone ever had like a candida issue, they'll talk about like, well, you can't eat sugar because that like feeds the fungus. Well, in general, like a carbohydrate, a low carbohydrate diet is gonna be, is gonna help you break that cycle of a dysbiosis. Um, uh, have you guys ever heard of like FODMAPs? So that's, um, those are like, car they're carbohydrates that people have a hard time digesting. And if your body's not digesting it, it can set up an environment for like a bad bacteria to digest and it can make like, so that like someone that has like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is like a really common thing that's getting a lot more um, popular as a diagnosis. A lot of times those patients are having a hard time digesting their carbohydrates and they're kind of feeding this bacteria in their small intestine to kind of keep perpetuating this um, inflammatory cycle. 
So Putin is that, but so the, the tough thing about FOD maps is, is you'd have to F really, F-O-D-M-A-P, -E um, is you really need to like look up a list because it, it can be a lot of foods that you actually think are healthy <laughs> and they're not. Well, I wouldn't say they're not healthy, they're just not good for you. <laughs> not healthy for certain people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like it can, and, and the other thing that's tough with the FOD map stuff is like, so like broccoli is like a bad map, or um, Eggplant, like tomato. apple, right? And like apples can be a bad one. But someone might be able to tolerate apples and not be able to tolerate broccoli. It's not like you have necessarily sensitivity to all five maps. It's kind of a, it's a hard thing to try to figure out, but. Um, Did you say that was F-O-D? F-O-D? F-O-D, M-A-P? M-A-P. It stands for fructooligo disaccharides, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, fructins, or yeah, fructooligo disaccharides, monosaccharides, polyols. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, yep. I've got one quick question before you go too far away from it. Do you find that diabetic people are more likely to be in a SIBO or a small intestinal overgrowth thing in your practice? <coughs> I will say that for sure. If someone has a blood sugar issue, we'll just, just classify as diabetic in that. Um, and they're doing the right stuff, diet-wise, I'd, I'd be willing to bet money that there's a large intestine, colon, gut issue going on driving those blood sugar imbalances, for sure. Like that, if, if you do the obvious things to fix it and it's still not going away, there's probably some gut issue driving it. So, so sometimes correcting a dysbiosis is like super easy, and other times it isn't. It depends on, like sometimes if you have a mold issue in your house, um, it'll kind of like make you susceptible to a fungus problem. And like, even though you're taking the things that kind of correct the fungus issue, it, you never really, you kind of keep re-exposing yourself, and you kind of like keep reinfecting yourself type of thing. Or sometimes, um, like the water source can be bad or like sometimes they have to treat like the partner of the patient in order for them to really get better which might seem kind of crazy but um, so yeah some of my some of my like most chronic patients so they didn't really get like way better until I treated their significant other um, <laughs> So a, a big thing too, I probably, I mean, you guys are probably well aware of like antibiotics. Um, you really try to want to avoid antibiotics, like how the, what that does to your gut flora. I've seen things where like that will mess up your gut flora for like a year after you've taken them. Um, so the more you can avoid them, the better. I mean, in some ways, some in some cases, we kind of need to just toughen up a little bit. Um, try to ride out these infections a little bit better, but it's easier said than done. Um, so the, the big things I use for fixing a dysbiosis is uh, these antimicrobial herbs. Um, so I use uh, noni, I mean I have like a 30 of them that I use, but in general those are probably the three main ones that I use. Um, like patients are always wondering what are these like weird supplements that I'm putting them on. These are, it's to fix a dysbiosis issue is, a, is the main reason. And the nice thing about these herbs is they're broad spectrum, meaning like if, because to me it's the total load on the system. So like if you take an antibiotic, yeah, you might make, you'll make a bacterial issue better, but you might actually open yourself up for a fungus or parasite issue. I like guess it's because it's all about balance. So like in some ways you actually need to treat like the whole thing. So you want things that can like take care of a bacteria, take care of a parasite, take care of a fungus. They might not be as good as an antibiotic as getting rid of the bacteria, but they won't mess up your good bacteria as much either. Um, can you read that last one? Just uh, coptis. What is what is that? Uh, it's just a just an herb that I'll use. The one I use is called golden thread actually. Yeah, I'm curious. Do you ever use any like funguses, like uh, mushrooms, like cordyceps, for uh, correcting dysbiosis? Uh, 
I, I don't actually use cordyceps. It's just, just haven't. I, I mean, I I know people use it. I don't really have a problem with it. The one the one that I do use is Rishi. Okay. Um, I've seen like I've seen cordyceps in like shiitake work well. I did personally. I just, no real reason. I just don't really use it. But. Um, all right. So let's talk about uh, free radicals. So. Everyone's heard of like antioxidants. Like, like if they're touting some superfood, it's usually because of all the antioxidants in it. Um, but what does that really mean? So like antioxidants are like our bulletproof vests to free radicals. And the way to think of free radicals in your body is those are like chemical bullets, basically. So like it, what's what's a common thing to happen? Like say say you got a cold, and like a month later you're like I'm still fighting this cold. What the hell's going on? What's probably happened is you actually don't really have the cold anymore. You don't necessarily have this like active infection. What's probably happened is you've reached this point of antioxidant depletion, and now your body's trapped in this like vicious cycle of kind of the same thing where like the cleanup crew keeps coming in and no one told them to stop coming in because you needed like the antioxidants to like tell the cleanup crew to stop coming. Um, so this, this happens a lot. Like, like a, a good antioxidant is cortisol or prednisone. So this is why sometimes like if someone has um, like a chronic or a chronic like respiratory issue, they, they take uh, prednisone for a week and they feel amazing and they're good, right? Like they don't even, like the, it's gone, all right? And the prednisone doesn't really help them fight the infection. The prednisone basically stops that inflammatory cycle from constantly reoccurring over and over and over again. Um, not that I want you guys to take prednisone because it screws up other things, but you want to make sure that you have enough of these bulletproof vests around. Um, so the main bulletproof vest in our body is glutathione, um, which a lot of people haven't heard of, which, like people have heard of vitamin A as an antioxidant or they'll, they'll hear of um, like vitamin E as an antioxidant. What those, well, like vitamin A does is like, so like a, a chemical bullet's coming and vitamin A can like stop it. But what happens is now vitamin A becomes a chemical bullet and it kind of keeps passing things along the chain until things get to glutathione and glutathione can actually stop that bullet and then doesn't become a free radical itself. So in general, if someone has like a free radical issue going on in their body, glutathione is the most important thing for um, putting that process to an end. But the problem is supplementing with glutathione isn't always, doesn't always work as well as you think it would. Um, there's debates on how well we absorb it. Um, from my perspective, the best way to raise somebody's glutathione levels is fixing their gut and their gut bacteria. Um, so that kind of always comes back to that dysbiosis issue. Yeah. Can't you just do it with pure food, organic food? Other than uh, sort of. I mean, so like glutathione is made up of like three amino acids. So you, in theory, if you if you had adequate protein levels, you would you should be able to make enough glutathione. A lot of it, it like when it comes to supplementation in general, the biggest thing is figuring out why you're running out of it, rather than are you not getting enough in. It's usually not an intake issue as much as it's uh, you're burning through it issue. So if, if you're, if there could be a reason why you're burning through your glutathione, you need to address that. Um, a lot, so everything I say too, everything anyone is ever dealing with on anybody is a vicious cycle. Because if it wasn't a vicious cycle, it would just get better. So like if someone, like a, like a good example of like, of a vicious cycle like this is, all right, I have a dysbiosis issue. It's screwing up my gut bacteria. Um, I'm not making as much glutathione as I should be able to. And as a result, now I'm not detoxing things as well as I should and I'm susceptible to free radical pathology. Now I can't get out of my, now I'm stuck in this state of chronic inflammation because I can't make enough glutathione because of my dysbiosis. Like all these things, they just kinda all self-perpetuate. Because really we should be able to self-heal and all I do is actually kind of give someone the tools to help themselves feel better. But 
it's all about trying to identify where these vicious cycles are getting driven from and try to figure out what the person needs to come out of it. So this one actually didn't have in here, but I just put it in here today because the allergies. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I had a question on glutathione. Yeah. Um, when you said that uh, it's difficult to supplement with glutathione because um, it's not easily fixed with supplementation, when you use the word supplementation, do you also mean injections of glutathione as well? Or you mean just glutathione oral? injections can work pretty well. Okay. Um, they're just kind of crazy expensive. They're not yeah. super uh, feasible for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't, you have to like, would have to like keep going. They don't like last, right? They're painful too. Yeah, I mean, I've never had one, but um, yeah, probably, probably would be. I mean, I, the, I don't sell this often, but I do have this, this S acetylglutathione. It does seem to work well. I mean, even that, the, the low dose one is like $2 a pill or something. Like it's kind of crazy how expensive it is. Um, all right, so allergies, and, oh, the other thing I should say though is like, I still think if you don't fix that gut dysbiosis, the person's gonna need glutathione forever. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. How much glutathione should you have uh, per day as a supplement? Um, it's hard to say, honestly. I mean, like, probably would depend on the form, but just from the one, that form that I have, which is different than the one that you guys have, I would say between 100 to 300 milligrams, which is probably, I think, less than the one you guys have, but um, it kind of depends, honestly. How do you test for it? I'll show that at the end there. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you use kefir at all for the gut? I I'm, I don't well I don't really like sell it as a supplement, but I'm like as far as like fermented foods and stuff, like I, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, my like myself personally, I don't use a lot of kefir, but I don't, I don't have like a problem with it or or like um, like kombucha is like a big thing now, like everyone's. <coughs> Sucking that stuff down. I, mean, there, I think you can take too much of that, but um, there is a benefit to it too. I've actually seen kombucha test well on patients, actually, like some of the, that stuff from that resurgence. Or I don't know. Anyone been to that place that we get the kombucha sharing? Yeah. Oh, we did? Oh, that's it. Spell it. So, um, so allergies, like pollen is like crazy right now. Um, so a lot of people, when you're talking about allergies, they think, oh, it's just like, it's a really bad season, but sometimes you really need to look at your own health as to why the season is worse for you that year than as opposed to the other years. Um, allergies are just another example of an immune dysfunction, honestly. It's an overactive immune system. Now, if you have food allergies, that's typically going to be driven from like a leaky gut scenario, which again brings us back to dysbiosis. But um, another big reason for allergy issues is uh, like say you have seasonal allergies like right now, is if your adrenal glands are getting, like you're, you're really run down, then your allergy symptoms are going to be worse. This is why like if someone um, someone's allergies are really bad and they take a steroid, they usually, their symptoms will get like way better. But you want to make your, you want your body's own steroids to be able to, shut down that allergy response. Um, and that's where like adrenal function comes in. And we'll talk about a little bit about that. Am I going too fast you guys, all right? No. All right. So stress. Um, st stress is kind of at the root of any issue too, or I shouldn't say at the root, I've said that a couple times. You multiple roots, I should say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like basically anyone that Anyone that goes to see any practitioner for anything, they've probably reached a point of the stresses on their body are greater than their body's ability to handle that stress. So like, I have a big thing on adrenal stuff on my website actually, and we can do a whole talk on it, but I still think adrenal things are always gonna be, they're, they're usually secondary to something else. Um, 
Like you need to try to figure out what is stressing your body. Like if you if you aren't sleeping and you're you're super stressed, you're 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 going to be more susceptible to dysbiosis, and you, you can set off that vicious cycle in your body. Um, other ways that people stress themselves, like. When it comes to stress, you want to control what you can control. So you might not be able to control your boss, but you can control what you eat, and you can control how you work out. You, can, you kind of can control your sleep. You can at least control your sleep habits. Um, so when it comes to um, eating, caffeine and sugar are big stressors of the adrenal gland. Um, that you guys are probably on the anti-caffeine in the Weston A. Price group here. Some groups will say caffeine's healthy. It's not really a health food, um, but. Yeah. So if, like, like if someone, I don't really have a problem with someone drinking coffee, it's like one a day. I, I basically will ask them like, do you need the coffee or do you like the coffee? If you need the coffee, that's a problem. We need to like address that. If you like it and you're only having one cup a day, that's not a big deal. But it's when you start getting up there and really, I don't know, multiple cups a day and you really need it to get through the day, now you've reached, there's something wrong. You need to figure that out. Um, so uh, a, a big thing, like I, I like to run a lot and I do a lot of other different types of like exercise activities. People, a lot of times, are kind of their own worst enemy when it comes to exercise. They, exercise should be a good stress on your system. It should make you like a better, more adaptable human being. But people kind of kick their ass exercising, like they just go too hard all the time. A lot of it just has to do with like our physical culture, like the way things are. Um, if you're, honestly, I could do a whole talk on like exercise habits. But one way to look at it is if, if your life is super stressful, boss breathing out of your neck, you feel like you're having these like sugar crashes throughout the day. Exercise can be helpful if it's easy. Like you shouldn't be like, at that moment in your life, you really shouldn't be going like all out exercise wise. Like you, a, good, a good thing would be like, you finished your workout and you'd be like, oh, I could probably do that one again if I had to type of thing. Like that'd be like a good like gauge for you. Um, So we kind of touched on this a little bit. So like adrenals pump out cortisol, they also pump out other hormones, and we'll just keep it to cortisol because it has the biggest effect on the immune system. So if your adrenals are constantly responding to stress and you're pumping out all this cortisol, you're gonna create these like cortisol imbalances. There'll, there'll be times where your, where your cortisol is high and there'll be times where your cortisol is low. When your cortisol is high, that's gonna kind of lead you susceptible to infections. When your cortisol is low, that's when you're gonna be like hypersensitive. Um, and that's a, really dramatic oversimplification of a really kind of complex thing, but in general, that's a good way to think of it. Um, all right, so key supplements for reducing inflammation. We already talked about um, butter. So the, I know like a big thing with the Weston A. Price is the fermented cod liver oil. Like omega-3s can definitely be helpful for calming down inflammation. I will say that I think people can do too much omega-3s. Um, and a lot of times, the omega threes will the person will respond better to, to an omega three supplement if they take vitamin A and D with it. Or maybe they need to take vitamin A and E or some combination of antioxidants with that omega three, and the person will respond better to it. Um, that's why grass fed butter is so such an awesome thing to take because it's it's got omega threes in it. It's got um, saturated, healthy saturated fat in it. But like Kerry Gold butter is like if you look at it it gets really yellow, which means like its vitamin A content is really high. Um, whereas like Orlando Lakes, the vitamin A content isn't nearly the same. Um, magnesium is, I, I would definitely put that in my top five supplements. Um, How much? If it's a new patient, I tell them, <laughs> I usually want to tell them to take it until they start pooping a lot. <laughs> and then start backing off. Uh, usually you'll start off at 400 milligrams. Um, Do you go with a specific uh, magnesium or like? Uh, the main ones I use in the office are glycinate and citrate, malate. Do you ever use the L3 and A? I I don't. Um, I'll use L L3 and E for L3 and A magnesium. 
magnesium out. Yeah, so it's the one that MIT developed. Across I've never range. used it. I've, is it the same as threonine though? Like threonine. It's a, I'm probably saying it wrong. Three. No. Well, threonine's like a. Sometimes I'll use. Well, I'll use theanine. <laughs> three. The one part. I'll. I'll say it this way. The one part is like a byproduct of the breakdown of vitamin C. Somehow okay. they combined it with, with the magnesium so it'll cross the blood brain barrier. Um, I've never used it, but yeah. So I was just curious if you. Um, yeah. Do you use liquid magnesium? I, ha I, I do have some at the office. Um, I just don't, I, in general, I just use the, the capsules and stuff. Um, is that the reverse of that? Is it, is it what they use for cholesterol? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think of resveratrol as a cholesterol thing, but I could see it being useful for that. I think of resveratrol as like the, what it comes from this Japanese knotweed plant, but um, I, I just think of it in general as a really good antioxidant. It'll, it'll test as a good antioxidant for the brain. Um, that OPC, that's like a grapeseed extract. Um, Vitamin C, so I'm, the, vit the only vitamins, I only use two different vitamin C's in the office. One is this Kamu powder. The other one I use is this, this standard processes Cataplex C. So I'm kind of biased towards whole foods when it comes to my supplements and like not, not for everything, but for certain things. And what I mean by that is like, there's vitamin C, which is like what they refer to as ascorbic acid. And then there's like the vitamin C complex, which is kind of like what you would get in a whole food. So like, there's other parts of the vitamin C complex, like like bioflavonoids and these like P factors and things like that. And nature's already kind of already done the work for us as far as making a vitamin C supplement that already has things in this nice balanced ratio. And then when we take too much ascorbic acid, I feel like it actually throws off that natural ratio um, of those other factors, if that makes sense. So like, I'd much rather give someone like a whole food source of like a like a natural food source that's just high in vitamin C, as opposed to like this high ascorbic acid dose. Um, same thing holds true for like vitamin E. Um, and I guess I kind of don't obey, obey my rules with vitamin A, but I'm always pushing the butter. It's kind of one way or another. Um, can I ask you something? Yeah. You, you keep talking about butter. How much butter do you consume a day, and how do you get it? Um. Try to shoot for at least a tablespoon a day. So um, just like um, toast or vegetables? I like to put it on a kind bar. <laughs> <laughs> I just take it and I put it on there. No, not a candy bar, one of those kind bars. Yeah, yeah. Like those almond bars or whatever. So like, um, yeah, I just slap it on there. I, I, if people see me, they think I'm like, Disgusting, but I just put it on there. Yeah, I mean, the, the best way to, for most patients, the best way to get in your diet is like steam some broccoli or something for dinner. Load it on there. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah, right. Um, I'm not against it. It's just the source would matter. I mean, I, it's kind of like what she was talking about with the pork and. The, the, that is an issue with animal fat foods is the toxicity, like where the pig came from. So in some ways you're almost gonna be, if, you're, if the food source isn't that good, you're almost gonna be better off almost leaning more towards like the lean meat. But if the food, if the animal source is good, then eat the whole, as much as you can. I I'm, I wish I knew more about cooking or organ meats and stuff like that. I should come to these meetings more. <laughs> no, it's pretty true that most of the, when you're talking grass-fed, most of the, the fats and most commercially raised food are getting heavy metals and stuff from the pesticides, yeah. and it's stored in the fat more predominantly. Yeah. So that's why you're really wanting grass-fed, so you're not getting the heavy metals yeah. and the toxicity from the chemicals, because that's where it's predominantly yeah, stored. Yeah, that's where it's kind of stored, you know? I mean, I, on a, as a side note, like, I almost feel certain patients that are that have obesity issues, I almost feel like their body won't let them, and they're doing all the right stuff, it's almost like their body won't let them lose the weight until they improve their detox pathways, and then they can start dropping weight. Like it, um, 
Well, weight's a complex topic, but uh, there's, sometimes there's just reasons why something won't drop weight and another person can drop it like that. Yeah. I'm curious about the grass fed butter. Is there is it possible to eat too much? Because, like, for example, the uh, the carry gold butter, I do like, I just cut the block like a quarter of it with each meal. So, would you say that that's like too much? Because it sounds like everybody's pushing that, but that sounds like a lot. No, it just lot. depends on the person, honestly. I mean, there are there there are there are people who are cholesterol hyper responders, meaning like their cholesterol profile. They eat a lot of butter; it's not gonna look that good. I don't know. You can overdo anything. I, I would just disclaim it with that, <laughs> but without really checking you out or. It'd be hard to say. Um, yeah. So my son, he got a cholesterol profile done on him because my husband had a heart attack two years ago, and he's 11. But I can still put butter on him, even though his cholesterol is supposed to be high. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be worried about him. I, I, don't know, I definitely wouldn't be putting him on a statin medication or anything. No, no, no. For sure. <laughs> um, but we're supposed to be cutting down on fat, but we're not worried about it. Yeah, I mean, I Price Foundation, and you know, we have a website that you could read until the cows come home. You know, there are there are article after article. There's a lot of really good articles about cholesterol, uh, written by doctors uh, and people with PhDs on there. So we, you know, very scientific articles that you could read on the Western A. Price Foundation's website. Like I would agree with that. A lot of my so like I have a, I have a, I have a article on my website about saturated fat, cholesterol, and heart, heart disease, and a lot of my thoughts on that topic are kind of driven by Chris Masterjohn, which yeah. is like the main contributor to the Weston A. Price group. Um, so, I mean, an 11-year-old, I wouldn't really be, I mean, I would have to see something crazy on his blood work, like some major thing wrong, like some where I'd be worried about a heart attack. Is that got yeah. all this, the, the full balance? All, you know, the yeah, I mean, it would have to be balance. way, it would have to be really messed up, like oh, well, 600 milligrams or something yeah. cholesterol yeah. level. Yeah. You know, like it would have to be like crazy. Yeah. As long as you don't have a genetic thing with it. Yeah, like, at, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they don't even, they wouldn't, the kid wouldn't even make it to that age yeah. if they had that issue. Yeah. Um, Should we leave that for a healthy nervous system, healthy brain development? So, um, and they needed to absorb their fat soluble vitamins. You need to use some saturated fat to make your fat soluble vitamins. So, but, but there's great articles on the Wednesday Price Foundation's website about that, fat and cholesterol and nutrition for children. Yeah, that's my main. That's my main. Well, we can have someone come up and kind of show you how my oh. treatment works. Um, the, the last thing that I, on my slide that I have is just uh, movement as an anti inflammatory. So, I kind of. So like exercise can be pro-inflammatory and it can be anti-inflammatory. Like one way to think of movement as an anti-inflammatory is like if I if I woke if I, if I stub my toe and every morning I woke up and I stub my toe again, I'm gonna kind of like set off this pain signal, which can keep setting off that inflammatory process like over and over and over again. One way that we break the um, inflammatory cycle is by blocking that pain signal. Um, and one way to block the pain signal is through movement. Like if I hit my finger with a hammer, I'm gonna shake my hand because it'll stimulate these other nerves that'll get to my brain faster than the pain nerves. Um, so one thing that people don't do enough is take their body through ranges of motion, um, take all their joints through range of motion. Um, this, is a, this is something that I'm, I'm really big on as, as far as like natural movement type workshops. So I, I have a MoveNet certification, which um, basically what I do is I do a lot of um, like toddler type exercises. So like if uh, like the, if you wanna have strong shoulders and strong upper extremities, you wanna hang. If you wanna have um, a strong core, you should crawl. If you wanna have strong legs, you should squat. And it's about as simple as you can make exercise for anybody. Um, but uh, if you have any questions about that, I can talk to you about that afterwards too. But um, do you have a question? Or, oh, okay. 
So I'll get into kind of like if people want to see how like my treatment works or if they got specific questions. Um, anyone that came to the seminar, if you're interested in my treatment approach, um, you need $25 off your initial visit. Um, I will just say like in general when I'm treating patients, inflammation is, that's the biggest thing I'm trying to address on anybody because I, I still think it's the biggest thing that sets off all these other issues. Um, so like if, if you have chronic fatigue, you need to get inflammation under control first. I almost think like a lot of people's thyroid issues get driven from that too. Like a lot of people get this hypothyroid diagnosis, but it's because the body is inherently shutting that down because it knows it can't handle the inflammatory load of energy production. That's kind of my own personal theory. I don't really have a lot of like research study to back it up, but that's like my own thought process. Um, there's a lot of other reasons for thyroid issues, but kind of goes along the same lines. So, does anyone have an issue or want to come on up and be a demo person? All right, you can come on up there. What what are you what are you doing? Cracking backs or? <laughs> no, so like, today. All right, so when it comes to inflammation, like there's ways to there's there's a lot of different ways to try to figure out what's causing it on somebody, right? Um, so you can have a lab test done. The lab tests, I'm not against lab tests. The problem is you can't test for everything. And like you might have a lab, a lab marker that shows up that's positive for inflammation. Like say someone has this thing that shows up that says like, oh, they have a positive ANA. So now they're thinking there's some autoimmune issue. But that's all it does is tell you that there's a problem. It doesn't really tell you what the problem is or how to fix it. Um, so not that this is the only way to do things, but this is how I do it. So, um, do you have any uh, pain anywhere? Yes, a lot actually right here. I just saw, I'm actually trying to see a duct actually right here. Okay. And so, your joints? In, and also in my joints, so I have I have joint pain for some reason. I don't know why. I just got blood work done and I have no idea what it is. Okay. The doctor doesn't know. So, um, if you kick your shoes off. <clears throat> All right. Um, if you, you can go on your back. Okay, head there? Yeah. So, so when I'm treating someone, like it's nice when I have a patient that has a, a specific complaint, like uh, it hurts right here. It doesn't always, it's not always the case. Like you might have a patient where it's like, um, I'm just tired all the time and it's kind of hard to, it, you can find stuff wrong with them, but it's just a little bit more complicated than like, oh, I have pain in this shoulder. So it's kind of nice that he's got that. So, <laughs> so everything, majority of my treatment is based off of muscle testing. And muscle testing, you guys might have, like, you guys had uh, my friend Luke here, Dr. Luke. Um, so he's a, he's a friend of mine. We do similar stuff, but it's also very different too. But like, if I need to get work done, I go see him. We kind of work on each other. But. Um, so to me, what muscle testing is, is it's a reflection of how your nervous system is firing, all right? So I'm just gonna show you guys a muscle test on his arm. So if he locks his elbow right there, I want you to push towards me. All right, so that's a good, strong muscle there, okay? If he bends this knee, brings that arm up again, push towards me, okay? That shuts that muscle off, oh, okay? Wow. <laughs> normal, all right? The reason why that's normal is when this light comes up, and it hits the table, it actually simulates a, a gait position. In this case, it makes his right leg the push-off leg. So if my right leg's the push-off leg, my uh, right arm comes forward, my left arm goes back. So a muscle that brings the arm forward will shut off, okay? The big takeaways from that are, one, to just see how, for, well, for him to feel how it turns on and off. But the, the reason why it turns on and off is because it's the nervous system that controls how these muscles fire, okay? so. So now what I want to do is, because he's got this pain in his shoulder, I should be able to find some imbalance in that area that just to kind of show you that there's something wrong there. All right, so you go on your stomach. All right, now I pop this to here. All right, we're just relaxed. All right, bring this arm up. All right, there, keep that there, push back. Now we're gonna come back further, so we're gonna kind of roll it back this way. That's good. Push back. That's good. Um, bring your arm. Lock your elbow. Okay. Right there. Go towards the ceiling. Okay. How does that go? So there's a weakness there on that shoulder. Mm -hmm. Let's compare it to this one. So, uh, hang on one second. Let's lock that elbow. Push up. All right. Can you feel a difference between those two? 
No. Yeah, see when you feel that and lock that elbow mm -hmm. towards the ceiling. Like that one locks. Okay. Turn it to your uh, hand. One second, turn the knee like that. Good. Push up. Like that one, I barely have to push. Like I push it down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <coughs> that's just showing you an imbalance. So in this, in the first thing showing up on him, as far as like a neurological imbalance, is this muscle that goes from his shoulder blade to his spine on the right is shut off, okay? And on the left, it's not, all right? That's all that means. And what's creating that is the nervous system is creating that, okay? So now I'm gonna try to figure out what I have to do to normalize that signal, all right? Um, Certain things will turn around. Another one won't. Have your eyes go up into the left. Go, go, look that way, you mean? Uh, have your eyes like kind of, kind of like. Um, oh, like that. Yeah. There you go. Push up. Good. Head in the hole there. Push up. Look for that. Oh, push up. Okay. So. The first, um, so the first place I have to treat on him to essentially break this pattern, because that, that's the one way to think of this stuff, is it's all about breaking patterns that your body is trapped in. Same thing as breaking vicious cycles your body is trapped in, okay? So, and that's how you can look at these imbalances. It's the, the, body, the nervous system is creating this pattern that his body is trapped in, and we need to figure out what we need to do to break that pattern, all right? So the first thing I need to do to break the pattern on him is treat the spot in his hip. And I'll show you just another example of a neurological imbalance. If he, um, if he bends his knees, keep your legs relaxed. All right, so that knee can get to your butt. That one's tighter, yeah, okay? All right, so like you can, you can see how easy I can drive that one in there. And then on this side, it just kind of kind of stops. Like if I push hard, it, it just springs back. All right, so. But if I rub his hip right here. It's really tender there too. Yeah. And then we do that again, bend that knee. And you can see it just like goes all the way, okay? Like you can feel yeah, that, right? Yeah, I can feel that. Go. Same thing like, if Tom, just give it here, slide to the edge here. Still face down? Yeah, that's good. Um, bring this here, turn your hand up, push up. Okay, so that's a weak muscle. You can think of like this knee not bending, that's like a tight muscle. So when I get on the spot, that's like what would like kind of fix the neurological circuit, which is like right here on him. Push up, and then that turns that on, okay? So that like breaks the pattern. Yeah, it seems stronger. So where the where that inflammation stuff comes into play is like, all right, well I could I could essentially like break the pattern he's in by rubbing this issue, but I could also probably find some anti-inflammatory nutrient that would do the same thing. Okay. So let's try. Do you have any gut issues in here? No. So, same type of thing here. If we bend these knees, like that one gets to his butt, that one's the tighter one, okay? I take this, we'll just place that right there in your hand. Bring those legs down again, bend those knees, and then it just lets go, okay? Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> it's so funny. That was, uh, that, was that cop this herb. Well, the magnet helps to amplify it too. So, like, I, I used to only have people taste things because that made the most sense to me neurologically, like how their nervous system would 
respond to something. But the magnet really does amplify like the chemical energetic signal of the uh, substance and his body picks it up and it just uh, lets that light go. Um, there's a lot more to the treatment than that, but that's that's kind of how I try to figure things out on patients. Question then? You know how they always have, you can buy those magnets? It, yeah. What's the deal with that? Yeah, I'm okay. just throwing it in the other. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a totally different thing. Okay. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, so so what happens then too is like, all right, so now I'm going to treat this spot on here. Mm -hmm. This is why, um, in general, treatments can be kind of frustrating. Like, you you walk out of someone's office and then your body just goes right back to what it was. Mm -hmm. That's because there's, you'll see, like, I'm going to treat this spot, and there's a good chance that that shoulder muscle will turn on, but then there's going to be a new place I have to go. It's because the nervous system is constantly adapting. So like it doesn't, the, the nervous system is not static. So everything that I do to him that treats his nervous system, I, I can't do the same thing. I won't get the same effect from doing the same thing twice. Does that make, I don't know if that makes sense. But. Well, it moves is what you're saying, right? Yeah, so like you're gonna have a new prior priority. How long does it usually take for it to finally, um, depends the, on the situation? Plant, like a new patient, it's like 90 minutes. Yeah. But I mean, the bigger issue, I mean, to be sweet if I could fix everybody in one visit, yeah. it's just, there's things in your life that will create the, cause the pattern to come back. Even, if, even though you're taking the right stuff, like there's just certain things, like if you have like a chronic Lyme infection, mm -hmm. that's one of the, more difficult things to treat. And part of that is like, what you need to fight that infection will always, I shouldn't say always change, it changes frequently, a lot more frequently than people would realize. Um, or like, you're treating someone, say you're treating someone for a gut issue and you're giving them all the right stuff and their gut is actually is doing better. But now what's happening is their liver is getting like overloaded because you're actually killing off all this stuff in their gut and now your body's gotta detoxify that. So now the next time the person comes in is, all right, now I gotta, I gotta support your liver or something like that. And that, that's actually pretty common too. Um, yeah, it's just things change. So like if we go back to this muscle. So if we go back to this, bend your knee. That's still there. So that's still screwed up as far as like that left leg doesn't bend as good as the right one. Let's see if we can find like a new spot on there. Bring this clinic to your elbow. Push back. Good. Push back. Good. Go on your back. Bend that knee. Go back. Ah, uh, that way. That's it. Go back. Good. Drop it in. Take that. Again. So it moved on him. The initial weakness he had was over here, like when I tested his arm, going this way, push up. Okay? But now when I test his arm in a slightly different position, hold right there, push up. Right. Oh, again, I have no strength. Yeah, there's, there's like nothing there, right? <laughs> um, so I dropped that arm down. We didn't, and I didn't, like, in truth, I didn't check that until just now. But the next place we have to go is for that muscle. Like if he bends his knees, okay, and we got the loose one, tight one, and I come down here, rub through here, and bend those knees again, and then like you can see the kind of just goes. Um, so, so 
Thanks for coming up. Yeah, appreciate it. You're really good. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what were you touching his feet for when you kept going up to the front and touching his Yeah, feet? so I'm trying to find those spots. And uh, what, what, do you, what would you feel that would tell him when you touch his feet? The, the muscle response will change. Like, I'm going quick, so he might not even feel it. Like, I'll feel it easier than he will. Okay. But there's certain, there's specific reflexes that work a certain way. And when the reflex behaves in a certain way, it, it tells me, like, all right, I got to find that spot in his back. Or it helped me find that spot in his hip. Otherwise, it would be, it would, it would take longer, mm -hmm. essentially. So I'm, I'm looking at these very, like, specific reflexes, almost from, like, a, a neurological hierarchy, like what what could be creating this weakness on him and then and then I just need to find it so you kind of find it in the whole network yeah like, so like, like the bro the the bound up spot here that causes this yeah here. so so yeah th that initial spot on him like he wouldn't think like oh my shoulders bother me you better treat my left butt you know <laughs> but neurologically what's happening there is it's almost like he's getting hit with a hammer in his hip and it's creating these other like muscle imbalances coming off of that spot. So then you treat that spot, the nervous system adapts to it, and now the muscle pattern that the nervous system created changes. What ends up happening is you'll get a specific pattern that relates to like a specific organ issue, and that's where I really look at the biochemistry stuff, like what's stressing this organ, which probably sounds really weird, but. That's so this is a lot more than kinesiology. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. it's it's still AK, but it's um, like all I really do is muscle tests. It's like someone might play the guitar, but they don't play like Eric Clapton plays. Not like I'm trying to say. Right, right. It's just, that level. Yeah, it's just a whole other level of it as opposed to like when I, muscle testing is it's way more of an art than what a lot of people would think it is. Right. So you just have you have to be doing it all the time and like really looking at it and like like on one patient the amount of muscle tests I might do might be I don't know like a thousand I don't even know like it's so many mm -hmm. um, and then the other the big thing too is just trying to like it wouldn't in fairness if he came up here somebody could probably go through and just crack his back change that leg length on him, mm -hmm. you know? Because that would have been enough to temporarily break the pattern. Um, but you need, it's, the real success is in how much you can dig on a person and pull out these issues that are really hard to find. Mm -hmm. And that takes time, honestly. That's why like, when I see, like an initial visit like 90 minutes, because you're trying to get through as much stuff as you can and just constantly dig for these problems. Because um, it's, that, that is the hardest part, is like you're just not with someone 24 hours a day, and then you're trying to do the best you can to find out where you're getting screwed up. Yeah, essentially, yeah. I mean, everyone talks about that. This is my way of doing it, you know. How much do you charge? Uh, initial visit is uh, is 150, and then um, with, so it'd be 125 for you guys. Um, you, after that visit? Then it's 75. I don't take insurance. I can take an HSA or a flex spending account. Um, you can uh, you can submit to insurance if you, or if someone was in like a car accident, they could submit that. Um, car accident, definitely. The the thing that's tough is like like my wife with my wife's job, like I can get she can get like pretty good insurance through her health plan and like through like independent health and. The copay for a chiropractor through independent health is like $40. Right. What, yeah, I mean, it depends on who you get. But this is like, this is like a Cadillac plan at her work, right? And <laughs> if I went to a chiropractor and, and uh, they saw that, they would actually, I'd pay them 40 bucks. They'd actually have to literally pay me back $13 because that's all independent health is going to pay. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, I know. But, um, I don't, I don't want to get into all that stuff. But, uh, <laughs> worked on him. Is it always the opposite side? Like no, not always. Yeah, I mean, if I like kept treating him, 
I might reach a point where the right leg actually became the tight one. Like the neurological balance almost, it will flip. You don't really, honestly, you don't really know, but um, it, it happens a lot, actually. So basically, the whole nerve tree fires. Yeah. Whenever you do something, you have a muscle thing. Yeah. It just one, it's just like a backup or a, 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 a you're trying to basically fix that neurological circuit. So like whatever whatever blew the circuit breaker or blew the fuse box, you're trying to find that spot. Um, and truthfully, there's a lot of different ways to fix the fuse box, but I do it this way because I think it's the best way to look at everything that could be set off the fuse box, basically. Yeah? I just wonder how effective was this on the aluminum like the OMS or it can be it can be effective for sure um because I, I well like ms for example to me is still not a really good diagnosis of what's going on right like it's still like eh, kind of renaming the symptom or some renaming what you're finding on an mri image you still haven't really dug for what's creating that inflammatory response this is a way to, to look at that and try to identify what's causing that, you know? Um, so it's it's tough, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I can't fix everything. It's just a, it's a treatment approach that is neglected, I guess you could say. Like that dysbiosis thing, which is like the most important thing to me, there's just not a good way to do that in a typical clinical setting and it just isn't getting addressed and I think it's the most important screwed up thing on every patient. Can um, the dysbiosis cause um, his pain? Yeah, for sure. Because uh, especially he actually, the one thing <coughs> I tested on him was like a good so herb for you, that. You treat it the way you treated him now. Yeah. Um, or that's how I try to figure it out, yeah, for sure. You, you should treat <coughs> and, and and also uh, physically. Yeah. So... <coughs> The, the reason why I treat the way I do too is like I'm using the neurological responses through the muscle test. So I'm using these muscle test responses to try to try to figure out where the problem is and to try to figure out what he needs to fix the problem. And the one thing that will screw up a muscle test more than anything else is um, if he has all these like little trigger points everywhere. So I kind of need to address these these things first in order to get like a clearer signal of where the problem is, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah? So then if you treated his gut issues, would it get better? And as long as he stayed on that diet, it would pretty much go away? It should. It he, he said can it be more complicated than that, but yeah, in general, yeah. I mean, that's so I have a weed allergy, that, that makes a difference. He doesn't even know he has. <laughs> I'm gluten sensitive, yeah. that oh, makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, in general, I would say, 80% of my patients have a gut issue whether or not they come in with it or not, or know it or not. Right. Um, it's just the way it is, but, yeah. I don't really, I, I don't really have like necessarily a test for leaky gut. I just, there's a specific muscle pattern that will show up on someone that's indicative of a small intestine stress. And depending on what the person responds to to fix that muscle pattern, that's kind of how I'll tell them like maybe certain foods they need to avoid or certain things they need to fix the gut issue. Like I don't, in some ways it's like, all right, if you have food allergies, especially if you have multiple ones, you have leaky gut, you know, even really doesn't even matter, right? And then um, it's more like, what would you do to fix it? And the biggest things for fixing that are gonna be things to help repair the gut, which would be like vitamin A and D. Um, and then usually like, dysbiosis type thing, so like those the antimicrobial herbs are kind of the biggest things for it, and then avoiding any foods that could be stressing it. And, that, and truthfully, actually, a lot of food sensitivities are temporary. I mean, not all of them, I should definitely say that, but there's a lot of people that see it all the time, where like a food was an issue, and then you fix certain things, it's just not an issue anymore, but um, yeah. After your initial visit, uh, how many visits um, would it be like a, like weekly or like? It depends what's going on. I mean, it, in general, I want to tell the person to give me four visits. Oh, just okay. 
but I was thinking you're gonna say three visits a week for no I definitely don't do it like once a week it it depends on or I mean like multiple times a week maybe like if someone comes in he's coming in and his primary complaint is that shoulder I might see him today and would want to see him on Friday but then I probably wouldn't see him till like the next Friday and then maybe the next week and then start try to space it out essentially um, so it's it's definitely a different approach than like you go see someone like all right you're coming in three times a week for the next four months it's definitely not what it is um, so that, yeah that answers just, your just out of cur curiosity in general um, like someone was in a motor or a motor vehicle accident you know, like they say they hurt their neck their back and they had a concussion yeah. And they go a year, and they're still just not right in the head, or uh, they're having issues, yeah. you know, and they're eating wrong, and they know they are, whatever, and they can't, you know, something like that it would be much more involved with you. How yeah, you but those are kind of, those are like my bread and butter ones, actually. You mean you actually? Because <laughs> those are what I, good, from my good perspective good. or from my background, because I came from it from a regular chiropractic musculoskeletal background, my best thing in treating is is a chronic injury. I, the The hardest thing for a chronic injury patient for, is for me to tell them, yeah, uh, you need to stop eating gluten because it's causing you to not heal from this chronic injury, if they're not open to it. Um, but that's definitely, I'd rather treat a chronic injury person than a chronic fatigue person. It's, Part of it is just because of how the muscle testing works. It's so easy for me to find something wrong on a chronic injury person, whereas on a chronic fatigue person, it's a little bit more complicated. Like it's not like, because if you have if you have pain somewhere, I can find muscle imbalances there super easy. It's not hard at all. When you have like I'm tired, it's like all right, I gotta try to screw you up to find something wrong. <laughs> and then it's not that this this approach would be good for chronic fatigue. It, I mean, it's it's at least something compared to like what. Your GP is going to offer you, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those are my like someone that's been in an accident, like especially someone that's been in an accident and they were they were pretty good before their accident and now they're a mess. That's like my best thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. What about someone like th uh, if you have thyroid issues? Yeah, I mean, if there are there are specific muscle patterns that will show up. It's the same type of thing. Like if someone's got a thyroid issue, the thyroid is you to me the thyroid is a symptom and not the cause or like there's usually things that are driving that thyroid issue and this is a way to try to figure out those other issues mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's definitely something I deal with on a regular basis but, yeah I have a question uh, cod liver oil would that be um, one of those things like the uh, butter or do you know mm -hmm. it, would be, uh, uh, it can definitely help for sure I get <coughs> I don't use a ton of it in the office. Um, I know that's like a big thing with the Weston A price group. Part of it is just trying to maximize the patient's dollar. And for me, the things that go to the, that have the biggest bang for the buck are those, these antimicrobial herbs that I use. That being said, if, if I had, un, if a patient came in with like unlimited resources, I wouldn't be against them using like fermented cod, cod liver oil or omega-3 supplements um, they, they can definitely help like people people don't eat enough omega-3 fatty fish for sure I know I, I don't I, um, I, I probably get decent omega-3s from the amount of butter and the raw milk that I get um, but it, yeah I mean I'm I think those supplements can be beneficial I just I don't when use them that much Yeah, but I got like, I don't know how many supplements in my office. I probably have like 200 different things that I use. But, do you use standard um, process? Uh, I use like, I use standard process. I use like six different, seven, di I don't know. I have a bunch of different ones. Now, what, <laughs> what, size, what line do you, do you have your own line? Or is no, I just use, I use, I'm kind of a supplement, uh, I don't say, Junkie? <laughs> yeah, it's like a nicer you word for supplement for. You <laughs> <are. laughs> but um, so like I don't really, I'm not really uh, too married to any supplement company. I, I, I don't know. I, I have, I have contracts with a bunch of different ones. I, I think I have like seven or eight different ones in my office. Um, 
pick and choose what you like. Not yeah. everybody can make everything the best. Yeah, like certain stuff standard process makes is awesome. And certain things like I probably use this one company more than any other one. It's a Supreme Nutrition Products, which is a really small company, but um, it, I, I definitely spend most of my money on them. Um, I use Thorn Research, I use Pure Encapsulations, Biotics Research, uh, what else? Claire Labs, those are my favorite probiotics. Um, I don't know, there's probably other ones, but those are my main ones. I did one quick question. What, which herb would, did you say would work well for him, the last one? You had a uh, that, well, truthfully, I wouldn't want to recommend one to him without him without doing more thorough inspection. But he just showed it right off the bat. He showed a good response to this Coptis herb. But it, truth be told, I, there's probably 20 to 30 things I could have tested on him that would have shown some good response at that time. That's another reason for doing all this other treatment stuff before you start assessing supplements because the body's gonna kinda, even if it's just a compensation, if it allows the body to compensate better, it'll show a positive neurological response, even though it's not necessarily addressing the root issue. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just as a status update, I actually felt it move to my right butt now. Oh, really? Was, yeah, it moved like from my left to my right. It was oh, great. great. <laughs> <laughs> take forms pretty long as far as like on the initial visit I'm hoping to get that information on the diet and stuff um, and the nice thing about most of the people that are here is the diet hopefully is gonna be pretty locked in or better than 95% of the population or is, it, is, it, is it helpful if someone brings blood work that they already oh have yeah I mean I, I I'm not against blood work I would do more blood work stuff it's a pain in the ass in New York State for Cairo's daughter blood work. You said it. <laughs> so I'm definitely not against it. The more information I have, the better. That being said, I, I, even from the, the functional lab perspective where these all these new fancy blood tests and stuff, I still think, I still don't think they can get some of the results that I can get in that amount of time just because you're, when you're, when you're, when you're working off of blood work all the time, you're always going to be kind of behind the eight ball because it's like, all right, we got your blood work, try this stuff. And now we're going to check your blood work again in a couple months and we'll see if it worked. And if it didn't work, we're going to try this other stuff. And it's a way longer, slower process than these neurological responses that you can see happen like instantly. But, um, <coughs> all right. Uh, well, thanks for, oh, yeah, go ahead. What is metal chelation? What about it? What is it? Uh, I mean, it's basically a way to, like, like are you talking about like IV or? Um, I don't know. Did I write it on the thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. on the slide. You listed on one of your slides. Oh, all right. So, um, so like heavy metals are an issue for <laughs> patients. Um, I don't do like uh, metal chelation therapy per se. Like, I don't, there there is someone locally that does that. Um, but I do treat heavy metal toxicity on patients, and I do it more through like improving detox pathways and giving like heavy metal excreting substances. So I don't, I don't, I don't really do like that chelation therapy that they do. But there is someone locally that does it. She's she's good though. You guys know Dr. Jennings? She'd be a good one for the to put on the list. Um, Where is she located? She's in East Aurora. Or, uh, no, not yet. She's Cardia Health. You guys heard of that? Cardia Health? Cardia Health? Um, she's she's going to be moving to East Aurora. I don't think she's there yet. What's her first name? Jennifer. Jennifer Jennings? Yeah. Okay. Um, doctor, she took over Dr. Barnes's practice. Yeah. Do you recommend any reading for somebody who might be wanting to come to you to get a little more background about your, your process? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I have a decent amount of stuff on my website. Um, Do you have any books? 
No books. <laughs> but uh, too busy. I feel like I have a decent amount of information on there. I mean, the other thing too, I should actually I should have said this. If you want to just uh, see how the streaming works for you, um, if you're not sure about it, I, I can do like a free 15 minute consult too. That's honestly the best way because sometimes it's hard to believe like what the muscle test is doing until you actually feel it. Um, so that's something that I offer to patients too. Just cause, honestly, it's better for me if they come in knowing what they're getting into rather than like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> thought you were gonna crack my back and like, I know. So, so like I actually, I, I do do some like typical adjustments like chiropractic adjustments, but definitely more secondary to other things that I do. Because mainly, to me, the, the same thing, it, part of it's just my philosophy on why those adjustments are needed. The adjustment to me is a symptom of muscle imbalances. The muscle imbalances are a symptom of nervous system imbalances. The nervous system imbalances are a symptom of everything, everything going on with you. So if you can balance out the nervous system, all that other stuff will get better. Still sometimes need to adjust something, but it's oftentimes is you can fix the need for it. Now like if somebody's taking like prolotherapy with the needles and stuff, yeah. will that no. interfere with you? What no, you not right. no, that'd be fine. All right, well, thanks for having me, guys. The information in this lecture is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professionals. You should not rely upon or follow the program or techniques or use any of the products and services made available by or through the lecture without obtaining the advice of a physician or other healthcare professional. The nutritional and other information in this lecture are not intended to be and do not constitute healthcare or medical advice.